I think a lot of us are familiar with your career, but I'm particularly curious how you got interested in figure skating at an elite level. And did, did you, when you were young, did you think I'm going to be the best in the world? You know, I think there are always aspirations and dreams of someday being best in the world, but like anything, it started out slowly. And the more I skated and I took lessons and started to compete about when I was about eight, then the love for it continued to grow and the passion for it. And probably by junior high age, I knew that was kind of a more of a a pivot point of like, okay, are you going all in? Do you really want to pursue this? Um, Because that's when the training started to get a little more intense and uh, time consuming. So it was probably around 14, 15, 16, when it was like, okay, I really want to try to go as far as I can, whether that's the national world level, you know, Olympics always seem just so far away. Competing at the national and world level were always became that a goal about junior high age. So when when you look back at the athletic portion of your career, what are some of the moments that you're most proud of? You know, looking back at um, how I trained um, and I had a really great coach uh, really since the time I was nine years old through the Olympics, uh, Christy Ness. And she just, she taught all of her students a really strong work ethic. Having had that work ethic and being taught how to set goals and how to work towards those things and to really make small incremental steps to your larger goal, that's what really allowed me to improve the way I did and and then ultimately skate at the, the top world level. The training and the work ethic um, and, and, you know, trying to carry that into other parts of my life, you know, post skating career as well. Um, And then obviously, the Olympics and competing there, the honor of representing my country and being able to handle the pressure uh, the way I did. Well, it's interesting you say that about what you're, you know, that it's all those moments that added up to your success. Because, you know, I think people see they see you on the podium, they see you getting the gold medal. And it's like, you just somehow miraculously got there. So it's great to hear you talk about just the, you know, the victories in the, just in the training alone. Yes. I mean, it's, it's tough. Yeah. They, they don't see those 14 years, right. That kind of went into preparing for that one moment at the Olympics. Yeah. I mean, I think it's always important to, you know, even talk about the challenges you face and the ups and downs. And then, and then knowing that there's a long-term goal, you know, right now we live in such a, you know, on demand kind of in the moment world you know, athletes, I think they understand that it does take, uh, it's a process to, to really get to where you want to go. What traits do you feel like molded you as an athlete that you have taken into your business world and your, your charitable work and your best-selling author and everything? What, what are the traits that you think really translate? Really having a clear goal and, you know, end game is so important in anything in life. If you have that clear goal, clear vision, then you can kind of set yourself up with, you know, how you're going to get there, surrounding yourself with the people that will help you get there as well. Um, You know, even in skating, it's an individual sport, but it took a lot of people and a lot of people on on my team, so to say, to help me get there between coaches and the skating association and my family support, choreographers, and, you know, just a whole team of people. So you all share the same goal and vision definitely helps get to where you are. So definitely that's, that's one thing I've taken away to use in my career with the foundation and everything. That's fantastic. Use, use the support around you and the experts, right? Um, In 1992, you not only won gold, um, you were also the first Asian American woman to win a gold medal in any sport. At that year, every U S gold medal was won by a woman, which I didn't realize at that time. What did that mean to you? Um, Well, I think first of all, at, in Albertville, the four of us, the, there were five golds and Bonnie Blair came up, up away with two. Donna Weinbrecht got the other gold and Kathy Turner and myself. We were, you know, definitely at the time, like, yes, girl power, you know, this is awesome. And we all felt that it, it was some a sisterhood. And I don't think you realize till many years later, kind of how big that that really is, especially, you know, being the only five golds come, to come away with that that particular Olympics. Yeah, it was good times. I think we're all proud of each other and definitely hoping that it opened the door for more female athletes uh, to pursue whatever sport 
it it is that they they want to pursue and you know, I think it was great uh, seeing, you know, following Olympics where new sports were introduced for women and opportunities in different different sports. Well, I'll tell you guys, we're incredible role models. And, and you know, in looking around at our world today and all the things that women are doing, we have the first female vice president, you know, and, and there are a lot more opportunities. But how do you think the landscape is to change? There's definitely more room to go. And, uh, you know, very exciting to have the first female in the White House as VP. You know, I think that is going to continue to help open the doors in other areas and shine the spotlight on other areas where equality can, you know, be achieved, whether it's equal pay, equal uh, representation in in the corporate uh, community. I think all of those things are areas that we can still uh, make strides in. And watching the women's soccer team and, you know, their fight for equality is is amazing. And what I see different too, and I don't know if, if you see this as well, is that women are now really supporting each other. Yes, definitely. And I think, you know, it's the power of social media too. You know, there's always good things and bad things. And I think one of the great things is that women are able to speak out more and to voice their support of other women. And it's, uh, you know, more apparent to everyone that mutual support is what's going to drive everything in the right direction. So women are supporting each other more. I think uh, they're talking about it more. And, you know, I've seen women reach out and offer to be mentors more often now than I I feel like I've seen in the past. And, And that's huge, because that's only going to make it better for everyone. Christy, after your professional skating career, what prompted you to create Always Dream and and why focus on on childhood literacy? You do such great work. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, You know, after the Olympics, I think it was just the realization how fortunate I was to have had the support of my family, of the community, of so many people to go after my dreams. My mom asked one question really after the Olympics, like, wow, so what are you going to do now to give back? You know, my parents have always been very community minded and, you know, volunteering at school and church and whatever. So, um, you know, it wasn't a a surprising question. And I took a look at things I'm passionate about. And, um, you know, at the time I was in my early 20s and and kids and I think giving them the opportunity to pursue their dreams, whatever they may be, and to have the support or maybe even just the encouragement uh, was something I wanted to do. In 1996, established um, Always Dream, which really uh, embraced the hopes and dreams of underserved children. And in 2011 is when we really kind of pivoted toward early childhood literacy. Many things went into that decision, but one of the main things was probably becoming a mom and having two kids at home at the time, about four and six years old, who we were reading to a lot. And really seeing the impact of that involvement with reading to them, um, you know, on a pretty regular schedule, um, help, you know, how that was helping them. And, uh, and just the shocking, I think, realization that so many families, uh, particularly low income families, don't have any books in the home. You know, it's just kind of eye opening, like, well, how are they going to catch up or be, uh, learn to love books, learn to love reading if they aren't even exposed to them. Well, you know, and I'm sure you have all the research too. And at the University of San Francisco, I know there's a real focus on in education on early childhood literacy, because it's such a predictor of success. And, you know, you and I are blessed with the time to be able to sit down and read with our children. Whereas, you know, if, if you're in a situation where you have to work you know, crazy hours and the reading at home and the access to books is probably one of the most important things you can do with a child. You know, I always say it's one of the biggest gifts that you can give your child is 10 minutes a day. Uh, You know, that's all we're trying to ask for uh, the parents and the families who participate in our program is that 10 minutes a day. And, you know, it could be while you're eating breakfast before you head out the door or, you know, right before bedtime, as you're putting them to bed, it could be become a bedtime routine. So finding some time here and there to share a book to, you know, even if you're not reading the whole thing, looking at the pictures and talking about the pictures, talking about the characters, all of those things are interactions with 
your child where they're making connections in, in their brain. So, so yeah, it, it's definitely the biggest gift that I feel you can give your, your child. Well, as a, as a parent of young ones, I really in particular appreciate that because we've been trying to, you know, our son is really active. So it's like, okay, sit just, and we've been trying to quantify like that. So it doesn't make me feel too bad knowing, okay, 10 minutes a day, we got this, like, yeah. you know, but it yeah, makes a big difference. Think- for sure. And I think it's even okay, you know, if he is active to give him a little something tactile to be doing while you're reading. And, you know, even if they're kind of doing something else, they're still absorbing, you know, that time together and hearing the words and making those connections. Yeah, it is hard. And, and you know, a lot of the families that um, we serve have even, you know, greater challenges that they're facing. I mean, it's particularly during the last year through the pandemic, you know, when we reach out to ask them how it's going, how, you know, we can get them to read more. And sometimes th- their only answer is, well, I'm just trying to get food to feed my family right now. So, you know, it, it's, it's difficult times and we try to support all our families the best we can in whatever way we can. And, you know, this year, particularly with the pandemic, we have put together resources, um, you know, according to where our schools are, lending the information of these resources so they can, you know, find a place where they can get food or other things that that they might be looking for. Wow, you you guys do incredible work. Um, well, it's been 29 years since you won the ladies figure skating gold medal at the 1992 Winter Olympics Winter Olympics in Alberville. Um, this year you're celebrating a huge milestone, the silver anniversary of your nonprofit organization. That type of longevity is incredibly impressive. What are some of the lessons you learned from your professional athletic career that you've applied to your philanthropic work? I know we talked about this a little bit in terms of skills as an athlete, but what lessons would you say you've learned uh, and that you've applied to your philanthropic work? Persistence and patience as well, you know, both of those things, because it, it is a lot different when you're coming out of sport and, you know, you're really so in control of what you're doing, what you're putting out there. But then, you know, learning, OK, you know, some things, particularly in the nonprofit world, it's it, there's, you know, a different type of process that you need to go to in order to, you know, continue to grow and take it to the next level. So it's using that persistence, like to keep going and to keep improving and to keep changing your vision a little bit in order to grow or go to the next level. You know, compassion too. It's like putting yourself in other people's shoes, really understanding uh, where they are and where we can meet them to, you know, make it the most effective and efficient uh, for what we're doing. Well, it's, it's incredible to see that kind of compassion and, and, and empathy and being able to step in someone else's shoes, you, it reminds me of what's the work that Steph Curry does as well. You know, it's like you, you use your profile and your success, but you're able to actually feel what other people are going through. And that's not always the case. Like, where do you think that comes from? Um, I don't know. <laughs> and maybe it's just part of me. I, um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's just being so grateful for everything that's happened in my life. And, you know, I pinch myself almost every day. It's like, oh my goodness, I can't believe that I'm sitting right here after, you know, pursuing a dream and living it and how lucky I was and, and wanting to, you know, extend that to, to someone else who maybe hasn't had that opportunity to go after their dream or even to live comfortably. So looking around and and being grateful and wanting to help someone else. That's great. Cause I think people that I know that live with really a grateful heart and gratitude and think about it and talk about it and live with a sense of joy are truly the happiest people and also have the capacity to give. And so it's, it's, you know, it's nice to hear you talk about that too. Um, speaking of sort of challenges and being resilient, what are the biggest challenges in scaling the focus of your organization as you guys have grown over the years? With any nonprofit, it's always funds, right? <laughs> you know, it, it's like raising the money um, to really be able to reach as many people as possible. And 
And, 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 you know, our, our program is very streamlined now. We're celebrating, like you said, our 25th anniversary, and we've done a lot of homework to be in kind of the second edition of our reading program. And um, it's really focused on the home environment for the parents. But, um, but you know, it's, you know, taken a, a lot of time to get to where we are. So how do you identify the right people to bring in the organization you know, who, who can model your mission every day? Right in the 90s, when I was looking to do something in the community, I crossed paths with Dean Osaki. And he became co-founder with me for Always Dream 25 years ago. It was a really great partnership from the beginning. You know, he had extensive experience in the nonprofit space already. We just worked really well together. You know, the last 25 years, we've been, you know, kind of pushing each other on, on what the foundation was doing. Um, his role has evolved in many different ways. Both of us have been really open at, you know, bringing in leadership and people on the team who um, shared the vision and the mission of Always Dream. And we've just been really, really fortunate to have, uh, you know, incredible quality people, not just, um, you know, as an executive director, uh, we have a, a new executive director, Erica Riddle, who's been with us since October. Um, my sister, Lori, is in charge of programs, um, you know, working directly with the schools, families, principals, everyone, and, uh, and an incredible board. So, you know, always looking to see where we need to fill the holes and keeping, keeping an eye on that and then being okay to ask for help out there, you know, and ask people, you know, is this something they'd be interested in? That's great. And working with family, I think would be just so, so wonderful. You know, you have, you have that foundation already of values and, you know, mm-hmm. to, to make it work, I think is, is wonderful. So, and, and you get to spend more time together, right? Yes. And I think, you know, there's an inherent trust there as far as, okay, we know, you know, what the goals are, we're, what we're doing. So, uh, so yeah, it, it's nice. A lot of people have had to shift during the pandemic. You know, what ways have you been able to, you know, better utilize the virtual world and, and what ways have you shifted your focus during this, this time? Well, it's nice that our program, uh, when we went through the redesign a few years ago, really moved into the home environment. So I think that opened our eyes up that, oh, hey, like, look at these families are all of a sudden thrown into distance learning. And, um, you know, we, our program is all about empowering the parents, giving them the tools to help and be uh, a big support at home for their child's learning. Uh, Particularly, obviously, we focus on the kindergarten um, age. So, you know, we found that schools and districts really, um, started to understand and see our program as, as a big value for that home connection with their families. But some of the pivots we had to make were a lot of times we see our families in person and the students in person. So this time we had to do much more virtual uh, trainings and you know uh, informational meetings via Zoom. Uh, we actually still had pretty almost better attendance on the virtual uh, side of things because I think people were just you know, starting to catch on to that. And I think as we scale and grow, we see that as a um, positive thing that if we have to do some virtual because, you know, of the number of students we're serving, then that can work out fine. So how do, how do you see virtual fitting as, as a piece? Like, are there certain um, monthly meetings or, because I found too, virtually, you're actually able to reach a lot more people that because I don't think people were paying attention so much online, and now it's just become a norm. Board meetings are online, and it, it, I think people have kind of gotten used to it. And actually, to not get in the car sometimes is nice, right? Yes, no, for sure. And uh, so, yeah, I think it, a lot of ways it's been uh, you know a positive there, and you know e- even we've done some virtual readings online. I did I did some story time readings and post them uh, like on Facebook live so that the teachers, students and other parents could just, you know, maybe have a 10 minute break in the day and, you know, okay, go listen to Christy. Uh, But um, yeah, it's, but you know, it's hard too, because, uh, you know, our students are kindergartners. So 
screen time is a tough thing for them, right? I mean, they're so much more stimulated in person. So, you know, we're really excited that most of the students will are starting to head back now and hopefully next fall we'll be back in the classroom in person so that when you know we are asking them hey can you do another 10 minutes a day or 15 minutes a day um, on your tablet with the, all the books that we're providing um, that you know things will start to kind of get back to normal and and have a good routine there yeah, certainly online is here to stay, but then kids need that. They need that personal contact, you know, and that, that social, this doesn't quite do it right. They need the social interactions too with learning. So I'm glad to see kids getting, getting back to it. So, but in addition to like you, you, I, I think you kind of have the Midas touch, like whatever you do becomes gold. I mean, thinking about your, <laughs> it's true though, your philanthropic work, your best-selling author, broadcast analyst. I mean, you were you know, dancing with the stars, like you, you've done it, you've done so much. Um, and, and through this becomes a brand, right? So just thinking about how have you worked on your personal brand over the years to kind of help you diversify and pursue the things that you're passionate about, just, you know, beyond skating. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, again, I just, I feel like I, I do lean on people a lot on advice and listening to, you know, trying to take in as much information as I can and then to make uh, an informed decision on what to move forward with, you know, as athletes, we're okay with risk in some ways. So, you know, you want to go for it, right? It's like, we're not ones to kind of hold back. Once I make a decision, then I, I want to be able to see a clear path of how it's going to work through. If I can't see that clear path, then, you know, I back away and you're like, okay, yeah, that's, that's not for me, or, you know, let's do something different. So I don't know, maybe I just, I choose things that I'm comfortable with, or, you know, like you said, passionate about, so I'm okay, you know, putting in that extra little something to, to make it work. Well, I think you're, you're very authentic. So I think that probably just naturally comes to you then that where you should go is like, I'm actually, I feel passionate about that. And that's, that's something I can do. Yeah, I guess. I mean, Dancing with Stars was something fun and I, I love dancing and I was a fan of the show. So I was like, okay, I know it's going to be hard and, you know, I don't have to win or lose, but it's like just the experience will be awesome. So, you know, going into that experience like that and, you know, there've been things for sure that I've turned down where it's just like, okay, there's just no way I could do that. You know, whether it's like, I don't know, so, you know, some crazy things amazing race or so, you know, where it's like, okay, I, I just, I know I can't survive that. <laughs> you know, I think again, once you find something that you really love and that you really believe in, you know, you just have to trust your instincts and go with that and, and, you know, lean on the people around you. Mm -hmm. Well, how just, this is a little, you know, as a parent, how do you, how do you do that for your kids? Like, how do you help them find something that they're passionate about? Is it exposure? I, I think it's exposure. I mean, they, you know, I tried to get them into dance and music and sports um, and kind of let them, you know, guide us to what they want, especially when they're young and little, mm -hmm. you know, like yours, like, yeah. you know, they could try different things. And, you know, but I, once they signed up, they had to follow through with it, whether they said, oh, I don't like this. But it's like, well, there's four more games. You got to stick with it for your team, but then, you know, but then try something else the next year or whatever. And, you know, they kind of found their way a little bit, <laughs> you know, they're six, they're 17 and 15 now. And, uh, you know, starting to, you know, find what they love the 17 year old, for sure. Two competitive parents in this household, right. My husband's, uh, NHL hockey player and myself and, um, in some ways, it's like I, I want to get them to commit and have the values of doing what they set out to do. But at, at the same time, I, I, I know there's a fine line of like being too pushy and, and, you know, taking the joy out of it because, you know, I'm like, no, you have to do it. Like, you, you know, it, it's hard. It, it is a fine line. And sometimes I, I'm like, man, I think I should have pushed them a little more. <laughs> but um, 
but you know, oh, well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. It's, isn't that a balance? Cause it, it, I think, cause we're going through the whole reading thing right now and, I, and I'm really trying to like, okay, we need, and I'm trying to quantify it and like, okay, push it. But then I'm like, but gosh, I don't want to then not want to learn the alphabet or, you know, it's like, it's just, you constantly, you know, trying to find that balance. And, you know, I think we were both lucky to find something that was like super passionate from really from a pretty young age. And, not, I don't think everyone finds their passion early. You know, I don't think it's at any point in life, you know, I think someone can find something that they really, that's, that's who they are. And, you know, I think, how would you advise people to, to find their passions? You know, try a lot of different things and go out and, in, in, you know, there's a lot of conferences that are talking about lots of different things and, you know, something might spark your interest. There's so much you can read about these days too. And just reading about different subjects or people you admire and maybe see how they found, you know, their path, I think is always helpful. Um, Cause you never know what it's going to be. It might be something artistic or it might be something technical. And sometimes you'll find out you're a great writer and don't give up. I mean, I think there's something out there for everyone and it's just a matter of finding. And I think the opportunities now, especially like you said, in this virtual world, so much is possible. I agree. And, you know, even as an adult, like there's times I learned something and I'm like, gosh, I wish I'd learned instead of a kid, but I wasn't exposed to it, but it's, you know, it's, it's never too late. Right. No, for sure. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> I, I've taken up a, a new physical activity this year during the pandemic, Kung Fu. <laughs> no way. So, yeah. So, you know, in the past, I would never have ever saw, could see myself in like, you know, doing self-defense or, you know, uh, martial arts. You know, my husband's been doing Kung Fu for a few years now. And, you know, it was something that, okay, I wanted to learn some self-defense. And then I decided to take a step further and, and to start, you know, working on uh, my belt material. <laughs> I'm very beginner still, but, you know, I think it was a good, um, you know, you know, something I just never would have expected, even though my husband was doing it. But once I tried it, I was like, wow, this is a great challenge. That's fun to hear. And, you know, I was thinking though, in my mind, when you talk, t- we're talking about your husband, if you guys get in a disagreement, do you kind of get into like <laughs> into a fighting mode? <laughs> that, okay, that's the fighting yeah. position. Yeah, or or I don't know, guard position, whatever. Um, yeah, no, 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 no. He it, it's purely <laughs> self self defense, right? And you know, you're t- told early on, like if you use it inappropriately, you're going to be kicked out of the school. So it's like, oh, okay, that's it. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's all about respect and everything. But yeah, yeah, it's just a fun fun thing right now. <laughs> I think in the pandemic too, it's, it has changed a lot with how people exercise. And, you know, unfortunately, I think a lot of adults have actually exercised less because you feel glued to your computer. Whereas when you're in the real world, it's not, you know, I've had more meetings than my whole life, I think. Um, but how do you, how do you motivate yourself to, to stay active? Um, you know, I think it's hard for some former athletes too, um, to, to have something that's motivating them. Yeah, it's tough because people ask all the time. I'm sure they ask you, oh, you still play basketball or, you know, shoot around. And they ask, do you still skate? I'm like, "Uh, no, you know, it's hard unless you have something right you're preparing for. It's hard to get out there and just, you know, after 10 minutes, I'm like, "Uh, okay, this is boring. But um, but yeah, I mean, it was hard through this pandemic because, you know, none of us knew how long it was going to last and, you know when things could go back to normal, we never thought it would take this long. Um, But, you know, I think that was the one thing with the Kung Fu is they uh, were able to do outdoor classes and, you know, very small because sometimes there were just two or three of us. Um, So it was something that was really the only thing getting me out of the house other than grocery shopping. (laughs) Um, So, so I thought that was good. And, you know, we have a dog and, you know, getting outside and walking him um, became a more consistent routine as well. So I kind of use those to stay active. Um, You know, yeah, and unfortunately, most of the rinks closed down for the biggest part of this last year. Um, So there wasn't really the opportunity to even skate. It's hard. Yeah, you want to, I feel better definitely staying active. And, you know, it's been a part of our lives, you know, forever. So it's just, 
finding the right thing. I've seen so many people like, cause I live near trails that it's like the trails are packed, you know, it's like oh, yeah. people are finding ways of doing, you know, what they can do. So that's, you know, I guess been a, a positive with this. Um, how do you, how do you think that people who work with athletes, be it coaches, trainers, front office, um, can better encourage um, athletes to pursue other interests or not, you know, maybe when they're in the heart of their sport, but to, to be, to be preparing for, you know, plans that follow. Yeah. I think that's always kind of been a big dilemma for mm-hmm. sports uh, is that transition, right. From athlete and having such a singular focus in your life for so long um, and then, you know, stepping out into the real world <laughs> after. And yeah, it's hard. I mean, I feel like there does need to be more preparation for that transition. Um, you know, where that comes from, I'm not sure. I think, yeah, definitely coaches and um, organizations. I know U.S. Olympic Committee helps with that, um, you know, with resources on transitioning and things you can do to help either support your training or support yourself post, uh, you know, Olympic competition. Um, but, you know, it'd be nice if, you know, all organizations with, you know, professional athletes in it had that as well. Um, you know, some kind of training or in, in just resources on, you know, maybe to further your education or vocational training somehow and, and to, you know, see what next steps could really be in your life. Yeah. And that's, that's good because I also like have seen so many athletes, especially if they play during sort of the working years of other people. So then, you know, they're, they, they almost, and myself included felt almost behind or like I wasn't capable or I'm, I'm people see me as just basketball or you as just skating. And so it's, I think having conversations like this, where you really do look at other people who are doing great things and go, wow, I can do that. And and it doesn't have to be the same things, but you see, you know, the, all the wonderful things and the skill set that we spoke about earlier that really translates and actually might supersede someone who's just kind of been working, you know, the entire time. Yes, no, absolutely. And I think, you know, we've even talked to like my husband and I, um, you know, to people in the corporate world who said, you know what, if there's an an athlete that comes in for an interview, there is, you know, a little bit more like, oh, you know, let's see, Um, because they've had that experience where athletes do have that, you know, the tenacity and the focus and, you know, the work ethic to, um, you you know, to really be effective and just really great in in the workplace outside of athletics. So it teaches you some great things, uh, you know, not just during your career, but what you can do after as well. You know, on a serious note, just don't want to get into, you know, politics and all of that about the past, you know, four years and just the, I think the hate speech and, and, and all of that. And just thinking about the recent attacks on Asian Americans and you know, just how, how horrific and just can't even believe it. Right. And how have you and your daughters been coping with it? And then also using your voices? Yes. I think it's, you know, something that you thought, oh, maybe it's just a couple incidents and things will blow over. But, you know, I think the shocking thing is that it's, it's starting to escalate, getting more violent. That's when I decided like, okay, I, I'm okay using my voice because it is important to shine the spotlight on that to really make change happen. You know, I think the more people you hear from and the more that it's talked about, people realize. I mean, I think living in the Bay Area where a lot, most of the attacks have happened, you know, we see it on the news every day. We have been exposed to it over the last year. But, you know, in other parts of the country, um, it's just starting to make national headlines, right? So, um, you know, that's when it's making national headlines, I think that's when, you know, local leaders and leaders in the community will start listening up and, and making changes and finding ways to get to a solution where the community feels safer and just more togetherness, right, to break down 
whatever it is that's spurring on these attacks. Um, yeah, my daughters, <laughs> you know, again, 15 and 17, they're of that generation, right, that really wants to be vocal and they're not afraid to be vocal, um, attending rallies uh, for various causes and being of mixed race, they're, you know, on racial justice for everything, you know, and, and they think it's obviously something very important. And, you know, they look at their grandparents and worry about them, uh, you know, as do I, and other family members. So they have a small, very small startup that is, uh, uh, celebrates their multiracial heritage uh, with another friend who is um, also mixed. And one of the t-shirt designs they came up with was a Stop Asian Hate t-shirt. Um, and the proceeds are going to um, Stop AAPI Hate and uh, the Asian Pacific Fund, uh, which is based in San Francisco. And these organizations will stay, Stop AAPI uh, is a tracker of incidents. So uh, people can report what's happened to them and they can keep track of what's going on. And then uh, Asian Pacific Fund uh, reaches out to and supports on the ground organizations that are helping, um, you know, legally and uh, for safety and, and things like that. And it's 2021 and we're doing this. Like it just yeah. blows my mind. And I, you know, I, I thought the Bay Area, like I thought we're better than this. Like this is, this can't happen in the Bay Area. Like, you know, and it's, it's just really disheartening, but it's wonderful to hear what your daughters are doing. You know, that, that, that they, they are a part of that generation that is not, this is not going to, this is not going to be around hopefully much longer at all, but when they become adults that they can make sure that the world is different. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, and they want to see it really happen. Right. I think they are so determined and, uh, you know, almost impatient in a way. It's like, well, this just doesn't even make sense to us. So, you know, it's got to change. So, um, so yeah, I think, you know, we, we follow their lead at this point. <laughs> well, how do we get a t-shirt? Yeah. So, uh, weijenggang.com is their website. Okay, you're gonna uh, have to, and you're going to have to spell it. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's basically, basically Asian with a W in front of it. Um, so Weijin Gang, uh, G-A-N-G, because there's three of them. Okay, yes. got it. That, that, is, that is awesome. <laughs> I'm a customer coming right when we're finished. Yay. Yeah. So they, they have some fun designs, you know, and, and it's uh, all comfort, you know, T-shirts and hoodies and things like that. Well, that's been a, a, a really positive about the last, you know, I guess year in a sense is that it just shining the light on the fact that we're all the same and that, you know, we need to treat each other with respect and, you know, look at the color of someone's skin or where they could, it's like, we just need to all get, you know, get past that, but it's going to take time. It, yeah. It, it's definitely going to take time. And, you know, I think it's starts at the top and how everyone's treating each other and talking about each other and, you know, trying to be more positive there and, you know, and then hopefully that trickles down and breaks down the walls. Well, I hope this year you're able to do your, uh, always dream. It's always a fun event. I hope you're able to do it in person, fingers crossed and congratulations again, not just on your success, but on the way you live your life, the great work that you do and, and how you affect, you know, some, so many young people and, and us adults as well. Um, <laughs> well, no, I, I, I should thank you too, because you've always been an, an amazing role model as well for, uh, as athletes and as female athletes, uh, you know, I've always admired you as an athlete and everything you've done since then as well. So, you know, it, it's, it's a great community that, that we have here. Yeah, I, I agree. So the, the thing I'm going to be looking for though, is if I can, if I can get my son to, to read and then I know, then I know I'll be a success. <laughs> Yeah. And you know what? Hey, if he loves frogs and only wants to read about frogs, then that's fine. Or like my brother, for him, it was basketball. And my mom's like, well, all he reads about is basketball. And his teacher's like, it doesn't matter. That's awesome. At least he's reading. Okay. So I now don't feel, I feel really good now that we've had this talk because now I don't feel bad about myself with, there's a book he likes and it's things that go. And it's all about, and my wife Blair is like, there's not even a lot of words in it. And it's so 
Okay. okay. That's okay. I mean, it's like you say, like, hey, how fast do you think they're going? Or yeah. like, what color is that truck? Yeah. Or, you know, anything. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, fancy. And and then you can maybe be like, oh, let's look, look for another book that has things that go know, in it. <laughs> things that go in it yeah exactly and then he might be oh yeah look <laughs> well he, <laughs> he said he said that he wants to there's a picture of a limousine and so when we get to that picture he says oh i could go in there and mom you could go in there and sister can go in there and mama can go in there and julie so he like has all these people in the limousine and you know so it, nice. it is fun to do with him it's just come on let's let's get, get on to dinosaurs or something <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Anyway, well, thanks so much for your time today, too. This has been fun to catch up and you absolutely know, tell know. A bit hello. I will absolutely will do. And yes, we'll definitely get your family out for the Always Dream event. We're we're excited to be there if it's available. Nice. Awesome.